best settings in the Atlantic 10, the Sintas Center at Xavier University. And this afternoon, the setting is heightened because the top team in the conference plays host to the team that is right on its heels, the St. Joseph's Hawks. And as we look at the top eight teams in the standings, that tells the storyline for today. Xavier in first place after the first half of the conference regular season and St. Joseph's right on its heels, sitting in second place. Hello, it's Steve Wolf. I'm Tom McCarthy. This has been a great rivalry over the last handful of years. And Steve, like that 2004 opening round of the Atlantic 10 tournament, when Xavier ended St. Joseph's 27-game winning streak, well, those are the kind of games that make this such a tremendous robbery. Well, they're both similar schools, and I think that that game in 2004 really defined this series. St. Joe's 27-0. Xavier struggling throughout the year. Both teams make the Elite Eight. It's a great game. Romain Sato and Lionel Chalmers led the way for Xavier. Meanwhile, for St. Joseph's that season, Jameer Nelson and Delante West. Well, those two guys were the keys for that run to the Elite Eight. Well, this season, well, these two teams, as Phil Martelli and Sean Miller will tell you, are led by their seniors. First for St. Joseph's, let's look at Pat Calathis. you got to love Pat Calathis. One of the guys who's vying for 8-10 player of the year at 6-10. Yes, 6-10. He can step out and shoot the jump shot, but he has got a quick first step, gets to the basket very, very well in transition. But this year, Tom, I'll tell you the best thing about him is he's valuing the basketball. As you check out those numbers, those numbers are great, but he's not turned the basketball over like he did previous three years. Well, he's also been such a force from the perimeter for St. Joseph's. Meanwhile, for the Xavier Musketeers, well, the last couple of seasons, it's been Drew Lavender that really has been the leader. Two seniors, Galathus and Lavender now. Lavender is 5'7", as opposed to the 6'10", Galathus, but they do it the same. Both have had a quick first step. Lavender is so good on the ball defensively and sets a tone for this team. But, you know, he can get out and shoot the jump shot when they need a jump shot to be taken. So you check the numbers out there. The number one thing that Drew Lavender does, besides playing on the ball defense, as he gets other guys involved, he is excellent distributing the basketball. Well, these two guys are the leading candidates right now for the Atlantic 10 Player of the Year. It should be a great ball game. They play all season long for games like this, games with meaning. And we've got one that has some meaning, and the tip is coming up next. Anticipate another sellout this afternoon here at the Sintas Center as Xavier plays host to the St. Joseph's Hawks. It would be the sixth sellout of the season, and why not? This is a tremendous matchup. Let's look at the starting lineups first for St. Joseph's, and Ahmad Nivens is in the starting lineup for the Hawks. There was some question as to whether he would start because of a sprained ankle he sustained earlier this week against Villanova, but he practiced yesterday, and he is in there. Meanwhile, for the Musketeers, well, their lineup has basically been the same for most of this Atlantic 10 season with Jason Love starting at the five spot, but Josh Duncan, he'll certainly be off the bench very quickly for Xavier. There you see the two head coaches, Sean Miller to the left, Bill Martelli to the right. Martelli in his 13th season at Hawk Hill. Meanwhile, for Sean Miller, his fourth season with the Musketeers. Well, let's look at the keys to the ball game. And Steve, your keys, I think, are the keys that these two teams face each and every game. And especially with Nivens struggling a little bit, you got to rebound the basketball for the Hawks, and you got to make sure you keep Xavier out of the, the middle of the paint. The other thing is to try to get going early. Now, for Xavier, they got to take advantage of St. Joe's, uh, you know, inside, and they also have to find Calathus, who's an unbelievable outside jump shooter, and you have to extend the hand because they have four guys in the starting lineup that can knock down threes. Well, Bob Donato wants to center court. We're about ready to get underway. The ball is thrown up, and the tip is controlled by Drew Lavender and the Xavier Musketeers, and there you see, this is the 34th meeting between these two, and they stop play because the clock didn't start. Well, they're also Carr and Burrell had a little grappling match at midcourt. They also stopped because of the clock, so I think it's probably good for both teams. A lot on edge right now, <laughs> but it was interesting because Carr and Burrell squared off right at the beginning. Well, Steve, we said during the outset that these two squads have played some significant games over the last handful of years, and Phil Martelli's team back in 2004, 27-0, lost to the Xavier Musketeers, then coached by Thad Mata. Then there was the Atlantic 10 Championship two years ago when Xavier won it to go on to the NCAAs. 
So the clock seems to be set and Xavier with its first possession of the afternoon. And there has been some home cooking for the Musketeers here at the Cintas Center. Derek Brown brings the defense in before he kicks out to C.J. Anderson. A little feeling out process going on right now between these two clubs. And Xavier knows what they're going to get. Phil Martell is not a guy that's going to change a ton of defense. He's going to play man-to-man -man most of the game. With a shot clock down to seven, a missed shot, and a rebound by Calathis. And now to Sheed Carr, the transfer from Iowa State, who's been such a huge shot in the arm for this team, running the point. Well, he brings the offense down. Here's Ahmad Nivens with his first touch of the day. They call it offensive foul. And the Nivens just slipped the screen. A lot of times you go over there to set the pick. He just went over there, and instead of setting the pick, you'll see he slips it and goes through. The limbless man on the court steps over and takes the charge from Nivens. But the, the good and bad news is, the bad news is it'll foul on Nivens. Good news is he looked like he was taking it pretty strong on that weak ankle. I was thinking the same thing, Stephen. He is such a, a force for St. Joseph's. He averages over 14 points per game and over six and a half rebounds per game. Burrell to the free throw line, covered by Darren Govins. Again, man-to-man -man defense by St. Joseph's. Each team with an open possession on its first possessions of the day. It's so important to have Nibbets in the game because they don't have a lot of depth. St. Joe's and got to go to Litchis coming off the bench. So Nibbets is a guy that really is important to them. Shot clock was winding down. Lavender was trying to draw the foul. Instead, it's a turnover and a violation. So the Hawks get the ball. He shot that left-handed. Yeah, he did. That's, that's unbelievable. He was trying to get some contact. It was a smart play. Real good defense in the half court by St. Joe's. So 18 and a half to play, still scoreless here at the Sintas Center. Musketeers wearing the commemorative uniforms from the 1958 season when Xavier won the NIT championship. And that team will be honored at halftime. I've got to say the shorts are a little bit longer than yes. they were in 58. You're absolutely right about that. Shot clock is at 10. Calabas lets it fly, and the rebound by Durrell. So both teams a little cool from the outside to start. Both have missed their first two shots. Burrell goes right to the rack, and he's fouled and go to the free throw line for two. It's good dribble penetration by Burrell. Xavier spread out the offense of trying to get something going toward the basket. And Burrell, the senior, takes Govins off the dribble and goes really strong to the basket. And that's what I think St. Joe's likes to do. They have Ferguson coming over to help out. But Govins really didn't get there quick enough on the dribble. Stanley Burrell, who had made 15 of his last 17 free throws, makes the first one here. And two minutes into the ball game, we've got our first points. It's 1-0 Musketeers. Make it 2 zip. Got to really give Stanley Burrell credit. He's always been known as a scorer, but this year, he has become the defensive stopper for Xavier. Yeah, he has had some great games against some key players. Eric Gordon from Indiana is one of those players that he shut down. Brian Roberts from Xavier, he shut down. Chris Lofton. Yep. There's a steal by Derek Brown. He's in the open floor. Watch out! Well, that's his canvas when he gets a ball into the open floor. You never know how he's going to finish it. And the good thing for Xavier is that he's done it defensively, not only offensively, but getting in the passing lanes. He's very athletic. This is a guy that's learning to shoot the basketball, and he has a lot of upside. So 4 nothing Musketeers. As the Hawks are trying to get their first points of the afternoon. Shot clock is down to 10. Govins in trouble to Nivens. Now with the shot clock at 5, Carr launches a 3. That's not his repertoire. And a rebound by the Musketeers. Lavender fouled by Carr. Go to the basket. Tom, St. Joe's really has got to make an effort to get that ball inside the Nivens. Saint right Joe's now, everything's perimeter. Even when Nivens gets the ball, is on the baseline, is coming out. And you'll see Derek Brown. They're at the hash mark where they're starting their offense. And Derek Brown just reads it very, very well. It's a lazy pass by Govins. And you'll see Brown taking it to the rack. But St. Joe's has got to get something going toward the basket. Even though they're a great three-point shooting team, the, the inside has got to be adjusted. Well, Ahmad Nibben, Steve, has just been called for his second personal foul. That is the fourth team foul already for St. Joseph's. Xavier with no team fouls just yet. And that's a tough one because the Hawks, even when Nibbins wasn't in, they didn't have a whole lot of depth at that five position. But now that he's back in, they'd like to keep him on the floor. He's got to play smart. Uh, you know, two fouls, I think it's a smart move keeping him in. As you see Kalathis moving his feet quickly, 
and getting that charge. But Nibbins is a smart player, played in a great high school program for Coach Bob Hurley. As you check out Nivens walking back, he's got to stay out of foul trouble the rest of this half. Well, he's 16 points away from 1,000 for his career. And Ahmad Nivens with 45 double-digit games during his career at St. Joseph's. John Miller will tell you that he thinks that Ahmad Nivens is the premier low-post player in the Atlantic 10. Yeah, and I agree. I think last year uh, he just really established himself, and now with Kalathis coming along, he has not needed as much to perform down offensively, but he still has not lost any luster on, in my estimation. Burrell with a nice move around not only Darren Gubbins, but also Ahmad Nivens. And he's able to get the bucket to fall. He's got four points very early. It's a four-point lead for the Musketeers. Tom, in these kind of games, it's really important to get penetration to the basket. The last two drives for both teams were going to the basket. Open it up, then inside. That's a beautiful move by Rob Ferguson going baseline. That's his first touch of the afternoon. And he's a kid who has played very well since the first of the year for St. Joseph's. He can do it inside, but you see a lot of his shots. The highlights you see on Ferguson are knocking down the outside jump shot. A very versatile 6-8 forward. Nice screen by Duncan for Lavender, and his three splashes home from the near side. It's amazing at 5-7 how he gets up and gets that release very quickly behind the line. I'm sure it's a sheet car and Drew Lavender have faced each other before when they were both in the Big 12. One at Iowa State, that's Carr. The other one at Oklahoma, that's Lavender. Govins for three, a line drive. Three, and it's good. And Govins has really come alive since the Fordham game. He was in a mini slump, went three for five against Fordham, and has been really on fire in the last three or four games. Yeah, last three games, he's had 11 points, 16 points, and 17 points. Brown, nice body control. And using the opposite hand, Derrick Brown is left-handed. He fakes to the middle. You know he's, gonna, he's left-handed. Goes back right and finishes with the opposite hand. So five plus minutes into this ball game, St. Joseph's down four, 11 to seven. We've got a foul in the paint against the Musketeers. That's going to be against Josh Duncan. Darren Govins trying to ignite this offense, not only with that bucket, but also with a three. And then Rob Ferguson with a beautiful move to the basket. Well, it's been a nice start here at the Sitta Center. Xavier leads it by 4, 11 to 7 off of our first media timeout. Yesterday's results from the Atlantic 10, Duquesne reaches the 100-point mark for the second consecutive game. And every time you think you've you figured out the Atlantic 10, then a team like Dayton goes down to GW and loses to George Washington, 57-54. It's always tough going to the Smith Center, Smith, the Smith Center there with uh, George Washington, but Dayton is struggling trying to get some consistency because the injury is the little and right. Well, off the timeout, the foul on Josh Duncan, the Hawks with the ball. Garrett Williamson into the ball game for the first time for St. Joseph's. Kalathis falling to the floor, didn't get anything on that shot, and Duncan peels off the rebound. Smart move, though. Don't rely on that jump shot. Get the ball in the paint. I think that Kalathis is quick enough to get around Raymond to get that done. B.J. Raymond has the ball up top, covered by Pat Kalathis. Josh Duncan, well, he's on the doorstep of 1,000 points, backs in against Ahmad Nivens. And a Dante Jackson. Good movement by Xavier. Shot clock is down to 10. Burrell with a nice move against Williamson. Stops and shoots the 15-footer. Doesn't get the roll. One of the problems that Burrell's having this year is he had an open jump shot to begin with. Made two or three extra dribbles and still got a little bit better shot. But you got to take the shot when it's available. Don't try to create too much. As a team, the Musketeers sitting atop the Atlantic 10 in field goal percentage. And also sitting atop the Atlantic 10 in field goal percentage defense. And that's the thing, Steve. This team, as balanced as they are, their defense has been outstanding this year. And Sean Miller has always been a defensive coach. You're going to play minutes based on how hard you play defensively. Ahmad Nivens with a nice move to the basket. He's bumped by Josh Duncan as the shot goes up, and that's the second foul on Duncan. And, and it's important that you get Nivens involved in the game. Uh, you know, coming off that injury, it, you know, you sometimes you're a little skittish. I think that St. Joe's played skittish against Duquesne because Nivens wasn't in there. Now Nivens has got to knock that rust off, although it was only one game. You see him getting some touches. Get that sweat working. Well, Ahmad Nivens on the season really has improved his free throw shooting. He's at 71% for the year. 
And there's his first mate. And it's a three-point lead for the Musketeers. Duncan will check out with two personal fouls. Adrian Graves checks in for the first time. And back in is Jason Love, the sophomore from Philadelphia. People wonder why Xavier's better this year than in past years. It's because of their depth. You got a guy like Jason Love that gets in foul trouble at St. Louis. Duncan comes in. He's a leading scorer. Tonight, this afternoon, Duncan gets in foul trouble. Love comes back in. Well, Steve, how about this? A 2-3 zone now by St. Joseph's. And Xavier tries to pass through that zone initially. They don't often see St. Joseph's play 2-3 zone. Sometimes they'll play a 1-2-2 zone with Calathis up top. Well, Phil Martelli, is, if he's anything, uh, he, he's different, and he will change up. Graves misses the three. Another rebound for Calathis. That's the third rebound for Calathis. He'll launch a three. It's a little short. And now Xavier has some numbers. Four on two. Anderson into the paint. Finds Graves along the baseline. Good ball movement. Raymond for three. No good. That was good ball movement, though, by the Musketeers to try to find the open man. And they had B.J. Raymond, one of their best shooters, wide open. Rob Ferguson gives St. Joseph's its first lead of the day. And that's Ferguson. I, you've got to love a 6'8 guy coming down court in the secondary break, spotting up for three. Nice pass by Graves to Love. Shot partially blocked. Out of the pack comes Calathis to par for three. No good. A little too quick with that shot. Nice save by Calathis. It's the pass back from Garrett Williamson. Hawks working around the perimeter, trying to find Nivens. Got a step on C.J. Anderson, who tried to go for the steal. And that was a great pass by Carr, away from the defense, because C.J. Anderson had him topside help. And Carr just whipped it in, a great pass. So Nivens now with four points. He, too, is in the neighborhood of 1,000 for his career. It's a 7-0 run for SJU over the last two minutes. They're doing a nice job of cutting out the passing lanes for Xavier and extending on the shooters. they got to continue doing that. Xavier, on their hand, has got to get the ball in the middle. Shot clock is down to five. And a one-legged three by Raymond, no good. Rebound by Carr. Up the floor, finds Galathis. First to the basket. And a blocking foul is called on B.J. Raymond. Well, the Hawks are on a 7-0 run as we go into our next media timeout. Ahmad Nibbins, sore ankle at all. Well, he is trying to find his way inside. Well, Drew Lavender certainly is a popular figure here on the campus of Xavier University, but so is Josh Duncan. In fact, Duncan, according to Sean Miller, has played the best basketball of his career of late. He became the go-to scorer against St. Louis, and as Sean Miller said, that's good to see. And you see what he's done the last five games, Steve. And, and it's tough. You're a senior, you want to start, you want to play a lot. Josh Duncan has taken his role and really grew in that role, and that's, that's something that, that's really complimentary as far as I'm concerned for Josh Duncan. See the season average, 10.6 points per game and 4.7 point, 4.7 rebounds per ball game. And he has 994 career points, so six away from 1,000. He usually has good games against St. Joseph's. Well, right now, he's probably going to sit out the rest of the half. He has two fouls, and with the depth they have, Xavier must have just had, they'll probably sit him out. Arginas Lidges into the ball game for Ahmad Nivens as he gets his first breather of the day. And although Ahmad averages about 38 minutes per game with that Ankle, Phil Martelli, I think is going to give him some time to rest throughout the first half and even the second half. Rob Ferguson working against Derek Brown. Good defense by Brown, but pretty good shot by Ferguson. Just didn't go down. Posting up Brown down low. Now Xavier's on a three, uh, last three-minute, 20-second drought. They've missed their last four shots. They really need to try to get something in the paint. St. Joseph now back to that man-to-man. -man. Xavier did not score against that zone, Tom. Under 11 minutes to play here in the first half. Raymond to the cylinder. After the bump by Lidges, he was still able to get a good shot off. Nice body control by Raymond. Lidges did a good job coming over from the weak side and helping out. Raymond just went straight up. He's got body control to put the basketball in the basket. So a one-point lead for St. Joseph's. Arvidas Lidges with a soft jumper. No good. Rebound is taken down by Lavender, and then he falls out of bounds. That was really interesting. You watch Derek Brown and Ferguson battling. Brown had the inside position. Ferguson, the ball went over his head, and he still went up and got it and almost got possession of it. Josh Duncan back in the ballgame for Xavier. Jason Love. 
Takes a seat on the bench as Garrett Williamson will inbound. Williamson from Lower Marion High School. Well, that might be a familiar high school to folks around the country because it is the same high school that produced Kobe Bryant. In fact, Bryant is the all-time leading scorer at Lower Marion, and Garrett Williamson is number two to Kobe Bryant. Talking with Phil Martelli last night about Williamson, he said he really is a sixth starter. He's been the most consistent player night in and night out. Really key to have him coming off the bench. Well, Phil Martelli talks mostly about that Villanova game where he had no shots in 29 minutes, but his defense changed the game. Speaking of changing games, Pat Kalathis' three-point shooting can change some games, and he gives SJU a four-point lead. Really looking for him on the perimeter. Great ball movement, got him a wide-open jump shot. Now St. Joe's back to that zone. It's caused Xavier some problems. Burrell for three, and he answers Kalathis' three. The zone is so tough for Xavier because there are so many good athletes on St. Joe going along. They have a lot of length in their, in their quick. You've got Kalathis, who is 6'10", plays like a, a point guard, getting those passing lanes. Well, Kalathis may not be the same kind of player as Michael Beasley of Kansas State, but Xavier did a nice job on Beasley when they played each other earlier this season. Well, he's 6 feet 10 inches. Well, I think they did a different job on him because they took him out of the game early, got an offensive foul on Beasley, and it really upset his game. Duncan Short on the three. Six points away from 1,000. Hawks with the lead, 17-16. Galathis covered by Lavender. Nice slice by Darren Govins to draw on the defense. As we head toward the nine-minute mark here in the first half. Been a rather entertaining game so far. It's fun to watch good players play. You see one of the best in Galathis. Every time he touches the ball, there are two white jerseys around him. Shot clock is under 10. Williamson, not a shooter, caught no man's land. Shot clock, as you see, is at three, long range three by Govins, and a rebound by Duncan. Very good half-court defense by the Musketeers. Really giving nothing up inside. Well, that is as good a move as you're gonna see from a point guard, Drew Lavender. Saw the opening underneath and just dove right to the basket. He is so quick, he's got a stutter step that really lulls you into thinking he's gonna pull up for the jumper, and he just goes right by him. So a one-point Xavier lead. St. Joseph's moving the ball around the perimeter. Darren Govins caught the double team, he just flat out lost the ball. Good defense by the Musketeers. Again, as Steve said, their half-court defense has really stepped it up the last couple of possessions. It also helps for the Xavier Musketeers that Nevins is sitting at the scores table and trying to check in for the last minute. B.J. Raymond finds Duncan for three. It's good! And a timeout call by Phil Martelli. Josh Duncan now just three points away from 1,000 for his career. Phil Martelli not pleased about the way his team has not only performed on defense, but also on offense. And Drew Lavender, boy, he just makes things happen. And you know, Tom, when you make a move like that, it really opens it up. You'll see B.J. Raymond on the next play, knocking it or passing it over to Duncan for the easy put down. But that's because you got dribble penetration going to the basket. And you got to respect those outside jump shooters. But if Lavender's going to blow by you, you got to respect the, the guy with the ball. So Josh Duncan from here in Cincinnati from Bowler High School. A great athletic high school here in the city of Cincinnati. It's produced so many great athletes, as Steve knows, from Barry and Byron Larkin to the Bell family, not even just David, but also his dad, Buddy, and of course, Ken Griffey Jr. Yeah, and they got a all-time Xavier great sitting next to us, Byron Larkin, the all-time leading scorer, doing the radio for the Xavier Musketeers. And right now, Xavier's on a 10 to three run in the last three and a half. So it's you been a game of runs, Tom, and St. Joe's goes on a run, Xavier goes on a run. See who gets the momentum towards halftime. Dante Jackson in the ball game, once again for the Musketeers. He's covering the ball. Ahmad Nivens back in. Jumper by Govins, ill-advised, rebound by Duncan. I say ill-advised because it was very quick and it seemed like he was contested. You get Nivens back in the game, you gotta get, take a look and see if he's even open. They didn't give him the chance. Jackson finds Brown for the slam. Dante Jackson making that extra pass. He had a clean line to the basket, but throws it to a streaking Brown, who flushes it. So a six-point lead for Xavier. 23-17, it's a 12-3 run now by the Musketeers. 
As we head toward the seven minute mark, another steal. Brown picks it out of the air. Burrell running the point with Lavender on the bench, finds Derek Brown. Boy, his control as he went up, I thought that was going to be an easy finger roll, but it seemed to twist his body at the last moment. Speaking of twisting his body, Ahmad Nivens out of nowhere from the weak side. Tom, he's the guy that was down on the floor. Derek Brown ran over him. He got up, and you talk about hustle. Young kids ought to see the way that kid got down the court. Ahmad Nivens for the tip -in. So he's at 990 career points. He's 10 away from 1,000. And more importantly for St. Joseph's, he pulls the Hawks within four. And St. Joseph's back in their 2-3 zone. Kind of a matchup the way they're, they're floating the zone around now. They're really protecting that middle. Jackson for three. It's good. They're protecting that middle because Derek Brown has been going through it very easily. And when you protect that middle, it sucks the defense back. And that's a wide open three-point jump shot for Jackson. Dante Jackson from McLean High School, Greenfield, Ohio, scored over 2,400 points during his high school career. Nivens with the rebound, an athletic putback. He draws the foul. And if that's on Duncan, that's his third. Let's let see what the officials say. It's going to be against Derek Brown. So the extra passes from Xavier helping out as Derek Brown converts. going to find too many more loyal people in the city of Philadelphia than Phil Martelli, the head coach. But there's his dad, Pops, Phil Martelli Sr. And you want to talk about loyalty. He is on every trip with his son's team. It doesn't matter where they go. And there is a family commitment that Phil Martelli has, not only to St. Joseph's, but also to the Martelli family. Now, we saw a play earlier in this half. Ahmad Nivens had fallen to the floor on the defensive end. He came all the way back in a matter of seconds for that putback. You can't teach that. We talk about athletic ability. We talk about desire and hustle. Ahmad Nivens on a bad wheel. Let's face it, he's got a bad wheel. And he goes down there, tries to take the offensive foul, doesn't get it, gets up, and finishes it on the other end. Credit. You know, look at Nivens' numbers. He's always played well against Xavier. He's always done a good job. He plays in either the Sinta Center or Alumni. Well, his first free throw is no good. So he's now two for three from the free throw line. You wonder as this game moves on how much that ankle will tighten up in the second half. See, I think I've had bad ankles. I think it'll loosen up. Okay. Actually. The second at halftime, you ought to be walking around a little bit. But you know, you talk about Tom Smartelli. Had a great time with him last night. Spent some time with him talking. And he just loves the game. And uh, I had, happened to read Coach Martelli's book and to understand how much loyalty he does have to St. Joe's and to his, his family. Uh, it's, it's a great credit to the university. Dante Jackson tries for his second three. B.J. Raymond, nice weak side rebound. Xavier has 10 field goals and eight assists, and six different XU players have scored, and that's really the reason why they've come back, being down 17-13 at the 10-minute mark and having a six-point lead right now. Well, that's where these two teams, I think, are similar, Steve, is B.J. Raymond converts the three because they are so diverse. I mean, you can go up and down the lineup and lean on different guys. Well, and both teams share the basketball. They have five double-digit scores for St. Joe's. You have six for Xavier. These, everybody in this game that's going to play is capable of scoring baskets. Well, the Musketeers with a nine-point lead under five minutes to play here in the first half. And a steal by Dante Jackson into the open floor, and he finishes. That is scouting. That is watching the triple handoff. Dante Jackson, the freshman, getting more minutes because of his defense. Just stepped in the lane and stole the ball. So now it's an 11-point lead for Xavier. Obviously the largest lead for either team in this ball game. The late this draws a double team. Picks it out to Ahmad Nivens from 17. How about that? You can tell he's worked on his face-up game. This summer went to Vince Carter's basketball camp to work on that face-up game. And really looks a lot more comfortable out there. The only problem is that B.J. Raymond answers with a three. And, and Raymond Tomlinson, Raymond's been struggling and really is starting to get his stroke. The last two jumpers look really fluid. E.J. Raymond coming into this ballgame was one for his last 11 from outside the arc. He's two for four today. Nivens against Love. Kicks it out to Tashid Carr. 
Musketeers lead it by a dozen. Shot clock is at 10. Carr, nice move to the basket. The blocking foul is called on the Musketeers. But they're finally getting something going towards the basket. Well, B.J. Raymond came into this ball game cool as ice from the outside. Well, this afternoon, he has eight points, including two threes and that one. You know, preparation for games like this happen in different forms. And for Steve Wolf and for the St. Joseph's Hawks, the preparation was a dinner at one of the St. Joseph's alums houses here in town. Ralph and Michelle Moresco, who every year when St. Joseph's comes out to Cincinnati, hosts the family for a dinner. And you were there last night. Well, I was there uh, not because uh, I'm an alum of St. Joseph's, because they live right across the street, as you see uh, Coach Martelli and uh, uh, my son right there and uh, Austin Moresco. It was a great event, and it's nice because I, I hang around a lot of the Xavier players, and they're very similar. Good quality uh, people, and it was it was fun, and it was interesting because at the end of the evening, Coach Martelli looks over at, at Pat Calathis and says, hey, you didn't clean up your dishes. <laughs> Put them away. So you can see a fatherly image there, but it's, it's fun. It's important for these kids to be involved with the community. Well, I'll tell you, Michelle puts together a great spread with her family. And, of course, the Hawk fans or the Hawk players get a chance to enjoy some home cooking while they're out on the road. And they took a lot of it back. Uh, I live literally right across the street. And uh, we're walking home with beef tenderloin and cookies. And yeah, dogs following you behind you. Neighbors following. The Sheikar makes one of two free throws. It's now an 11-point Xavier lead. Largest lead has been 12. You just saw that at 34-22. As we wind toward three and a half left to play here in the first half. Duncan inside. Powers his way to the hook. And he's within one of 1,000. And he could get it here to finish off the three-point play. And more importantly, that's the third foul on Nivens. And that was a call out of the timeout. I guarantee you that Sean Miller said we got one-on-one. -on -one. Duncan and Nivens, somebody's going to get their third foul, and it happened to be Nivens. And Abaz just got kind of tied up underneath and just shoulder bumps Josh Duncan. So Duncan now on the line with 999 career points. And it was an inside move. And he misses the free throw. You would have thought it would have been a three because he's an outside player, but real strong move by Josh Duncan. Well, Josh Duncan has been part of a, a Xavier bench that's dominated the scoring in this first half. They've outscored St. Joseph's bench 18 zip. They started out one of five in the game, but now they're six of eight. Foul five, a foul Derek away from the basket on Derrick Brown. That's his second personal, his second second personal foul. He did a little dance to try to plead his case after that foul was called. He's trying to hedge out. What, what you're supposed to do is get over there to, to stop him. You're not going over there to steal the ball. And I think Derrick got a little bit over aggressive. You, know, you want to help out hedge and then sprint back to your man. So Pat Calathis will go to the free throw line for one and one opportunity. Galate is one of the best free throw shooters on the team at 81%, and he makes his first. And you and I were talking during the break that if SJU is going to get back into this ball game before the end of the first half, they're going to need something from Pat Galatis. And he's so unbelievably versatile. You got to use him in any way you can. Whether if the jump shot's not going, you got to post him up. The other thing is they're not getting out in transition because Xavier's been scoring the last couple of times. They're not getting up and down the court. So again, the 2 3 zone with Lidges in the middle, and he's going to be in the middle for the rest of the half. We're under three minutes to play. It's an 11 point Xavier lead. Xavier is fifth in the, or fourth in the league in scoring at 77.8, but St. Joseph's right there as well at fifth in the Atlantic 10. The shot clock is under 10. Raymond outside against Calathis into the paint, finds Graves in the corner. Long, looping three. That's your ninth man on the Xavier bench. That shows you how deep they really are. See what Xavier's done from outside the arc since the beginning. They were one for five and are now six for their last eight. And Rob Ferguson answers that three with a three of his own. And every time Xavier gets on a run, Calathis, Ferguson, Nivens trying to bring it back to earth. They got to stay close. We talked about getting out early. They got out early, but then Xavier made a run back at them. 
Two minutes and counting left to play here in the first half. Lavender circling around the perimeter with Burrell. Lavender just too much speed for Ligis. He tried the floater. Love with a nice rebound shot blocked by Ferguson. And now the Hawks in transition. But Williamson doesn't have numbers, so he has to pull it out. Ligis is the five in this offense. To Sheet Carr. Whoa, what a shot. He's going away from the basket with his body away from the basket. And pulls up and shoots his main air. Just a really nice body control drive to the basket by the Sheet Carr. Well, nine point lead now for Xavier. Sean Miller calls the timeout. To Sheet Carr, the transfer from Iowa State. He was going, as Steve said, toward the baseline with that one. He's going away from the basket. That's a hard, that's like throwing a football across, across your body. Field, yeah. Across your body. And now the three point shooting for the Musketeers. And that really, Steve, has been the difference in this game. And it's because it's dribble penetration. Every shot is wide open three because these are both good defensive teams drawing the defense in with a dribble drive and then kicking it back out. Well, see, the objective usually is when you're down double digits to get it to single digits before the half. I mean, isn't that true? Yeah, and I think this year's team, as opposed to last year's team, this St. Joe's team can come back. They have played when they've been down, and they can come back. Well, Phil Bartelli said yesterday that his team's basketball maturity has improved from last year to this year and from the beginning of this year to where it is now. They lost some tough games early on. Syracuse at the buzzer. Gonzaga in overtime. Creighton in overtime. And as the years gone on, they've won those kind of games. And I think it's a team, but I think it's also Coach Phil Martelli's attitude. You know, his wife wrote him a little note card that said, be demanding, not demeaning. And I think last year he practiced longer and, and really was tough on those young kids. This year they're starting to listen and understand. Battle for the loose ball. Lavender picks it up and has it stolen away. Love takes it out of the air, and he's found going up. It's a rivalry game. Everybody down the floor is up. The ball's loose, and you'll see Love right there. Watch Lavender get into the mix. Guys fighting for the basketball. Jason Love, the biggest guy on Xavier's team, coming up with the, with the uh, basically the shot attempt at the basket. So Jason Love to the free throw line. He's at 63% for the season. His first shot of the day, no good. Darren Govins is going to check back in. He'll check in for Idris Hilliard, who was just in for a few moments. There's Hilliard, the freshman from the Hun School in New Jersey. It was a three-time All-State selection. Second shot by Love, no good. Kalathis with the rebound, that's his sixth. He has only five points, but he has six rebounds in this first half. So we head toward the one-minute mark now in the first. And Xavier hanging on to a nine-point lead. I never want to say a possession is big in the first half, but this could be a big possession for the Hawks because they're climbing closer to Sheet Carr with another kind of circus move. He has kept them in the game, not just by the offensive moves, but he's making good decisions in the offensive set, getting guys open. He's the guy that got Ferguson open for the three, but he also is driving to the basket really strong. has a lot of momentum. Burrell with a long bounce pass to the opposite side, cut off by Tashit Carr. Just the second turnover of the half for Xavier. Here's Govins for three, no oh. good. Kalathis battling with Love, and Love gets the rebound, but Carr pulls off the steal. He leaves it for Williamson, and the finger roll it doesn't matter. It's an offensive foul. Tashit Carr is everywhere. He got the steal on the defensive end, then he went back oh. after that rebound by Xavier and got the steal. He's been in all the passing lanes, but Xavier's really not batting the basketball right now. You see Jason Love going out of bounds. And then on the other end, Stanley Burrell with a one-handed pass. And I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know about that call right there. You're right under the basket. Nice job, though, by Love to recover. Yes. Big guy getting back in the paint. Shot clock is off. Game clock is under 10 seconds. Lavender ball in hand to C.J. Anderson. Hops and spins against Rob Ferguson. That's all C.J. Anderson. And then Xavier really needed that. They struggled. And Anderson had not scored until that basket. But good penetrating move. And Xavier goes into the break up by nine. 41-32 the score. It's been a lot of the defensive end for the Xavier Musketeers. Plus their three-point shooting. That's helped Sean Miller's squad run out to a nine-point lead. We're at halftime on Halftime Show when we return. Now to 
President's Day. Get pre-spring Toyota savings. Get 2.9 financing or 750 cash back on a new 08 Camry. Or lease one for just $229 a month. Get the biggest cash back ever on Corolla. $1,500. That's $1,500 back on the last of the 08 Corollas. Or get 0% financing or up to $4,000 back on Tundra. Motor Trend's 2008 Truck of the Year. Pre-spring Toyota savings. Now through President's Day. For a dealer near you, visit buyatoyota.com. The beat is back. Three ball, corner pocket. Another one. It's not oh, oh. It's not out of there. The finish is good. College basketball. Brought to life. Don't miss a single beat. NCAA men's basketball. Possession. CSTV. To experience Xavier University today is to experience Xavier University, creating a 21st century learning environment. Experience the power of X. Power for a lifetime. 41-32 the score. We're at halftime here at the Sintas Center. They're honoring the 1958 NIT champion Xavier Musketeers. Hello, it's Steve Wolf. I'm Tom McCarthy. Xavier's on top. And boy, I'll tell you, defensively, Steve, I thought Xavier played an exceptional first half. I think they did a great job of getting in the passing lanes. Uh, they also had four steals in the first half. Derek Brown is long and athletic. And you're right, their defense was really stellar in half court. Well, they only had three turnovers in the first half, the Musketeers. Meanwhile, for St. Joseph's, they were kind of finding their way. They had a lead at one point in the in the first half, but then Xavier went on a very comfortable run to take the lead into halftime. Let's take a look at the highlights from the first half. First for the St. Joseph's Hawks. And they, they got it going early, getting to the basket. Govins getting around Burrell and making an acrobatic move to the basket. And also, you know, Calathis knocking one down from outside. But then again, coming to the basket, Govins taking a strong Nevins having the stick back. Nevins with three fouls in the first half. But for Xavier, Burrell getting the nice dish to Brown. Brown had a very nice half going to the basket. Well, he had a fantastic half going to the basket. Drew Lavender, one of the best moves of the afternoon. That one right there, just finding his way to the cylinder. And B.J. Raymond also with an impressive first half. In fact, the bench scoring for Xavier in the first half. Josh Duncan got closer to 1,000. The bench scoring was dominant. I think B.J. Raymond and Dante Jackson. Jackson only played five minutes. And he had five points, really gave superb minutes while he was in there. Well, there you see the statistics for the first half. Xavier, 7 of 13 from outside the arc. But also, they've outscored St. Joseph's 18 to 10 in the paint. And the bench scoring again, 21 zip. Xavier is holding that mount margin over St. Joseph's. And I guess in the second half, there's going to be a couple things that needs to happen for St. Joseph's. One of those things that Pat Calathis is going to have to get on track. I think Calathis is going to get on track. They have to make sure they always let Nevins touch the ball. But you can see why Xavier is one of the superb teams in this country because of their depth. Everybody gets involved in the action on the offense, and they're playing solid half-court defense. Yeah, their balance was outstanding in the first half. Let's see if it carries over to the second half. It's coming up. St. Joseph's and Xavier second half action after these messages. Well, back here at the Sintas Center, you know, when you make it to the NIT, it's always an added bonus, particularly if you don't make it to the NCAAs. But back in the 50s, the NIT was where it was to be. And the Xavier Musketeers and that 57-58 team won the National Invitation Tournament Championship, and they did so over Dayton. And, Steve, you and I were talking before the ball game that you said for a long time around here at Xavier, that was really all you could talk about. It really was the benchmark. As you look at Hank Stein, who was the MVP of the tournament, you see some of the guys that played on this team. Xavier's history, you know, was really based upon this NIT championship. And as you were, you know, alluding before, is that the NCAA wasn't as big as it is now. Right. It was really, this was the national uh, invitational tournament. And they meant that. 
we see Coach Don Ruberg, who was an assistant coach of Jim McCaffrey on that team, uh, you know, and ended up coming on and being uh, the head coach down the road. But that group of people right there really paved the way for the players that are playing here today. Well, the Xavier Athletic Department honored that 1958 team uh, today at halftime. It was a great ceremony. They each walked away with a commemorative jersey, their jersey, plus a uh, 50th anniversary watch as well. Mike Babinski, the athletic director here at Xavier University, and uh, Father Michael Graham, the president of Xavier, really led the charge and really did a fantastic job with those ceremonies. Now, the game at hand here, they're your leading scorers from the first half. Ahmad Dibbins leads the way for St. Joseph's. C.J. Raymond off the bench leads the way for Xavier. And Phil Margelli really rolled the dice with Nevins because uh, he had two early fouls and left him in the game. And credit Nevins for staying foul free until the last couple minutes of that first half. But, uh, you know, you got Burrell dribble penetration getting Raymond those threes. Uh, they continue penetrating. But St. Joe's has got to get something going to the basket. They've got to get Calathis going. He's a leading scorer, and he really hasn't done much the first half. And we mentioned before that B.J. Raymond had been one for his last 11 from outside the arc coming into today's ballgame. And it's been his threes. He's got two. He's two for four. It was his threes that really helped extend the lead for the Musketeers in the first half. And when you have a guy that hits like that, you see Burrell hit a jumper now and again, you really extend that defense, which makes it easier for the guys like Brown and Love and C.J. Anderson to get chippies in the lane. It also, Tom, makes it hard to box out because there's going to be longer rebounds. There's going to be more offensive boards for the Musketeers. Well, as we get set for the second half to get underway, what do you think Phil Martelli needs to have his crew do? Uh, exactly what we're talking about. Calathis has to get involved, and, and it's not only up to Govins and to Carr. It's up to Calathis. He's got to continue moving without the basketball. They have to get some transition back baskets. Xavier's been shooting so well the second half of the first half that there haven't been that many rebounds. So they got to get it up and down a little bit because they do like to score in transition. And so far, they've, they've struggled to get any outlet uh, passes and get any easy uh, chippies off the, the transition. Well, we'll also see if St. Joseph's comes out with their 2-3 zone, which we saw an awful lot of uh, in that first half against the Xavier squad. Normally a man-to-man -man team. They mix in zone from time to time. They had a, a very effective 1-2-2 zone earlier this season. And we'll see how Xavier uh, is able to adapt to that. There's Pat Calathis, who is sixth in the 8-10 in scoring. Average 18 and a half points per game. B.J. Raymond, who leads the way for the Musketeers, had five points in his last two games. We talked about his three-point shooting, and today he already has eight points. And he's done a nice job, but you got to credit the guys that are getting the basketball. Xavier has 13 assists and only three turnovers, so they're really valuing the ball and they're sharing the ball. Well, the two of those turnovers came in the final minute or so of that first half. So as the second half gets underway, St. Joseph's with the ball, Xavier though with a nine point lead. Galathus with his first touch of the second half, kicks it off to the corner for Govins. Rob Ferguson puts it on the floor. Nice power move against Derek Brown. Is that George Mike? Or is that Ferguson going to the hoop? Nice jump hook for Ferguson. A well, lot of there just answers with a, a slice right to the hoop. And that's a dagger to the heart because Lavender is the senior and he knows to make sure that he gets that transition basket. St. Joe doesn't get the momentum. Tashid Carr had a gimme but couldn't get it to roll. It rolled off the back of the iron. And Xavier with the lead and the ball. Turnover force. Calathis in transition. Anderson tracks him down. What a move by Calathis, who goes up and is fouled from behind. A behind-the-back dribble move that freed him from C.J. Anderson. And let's let's uh, refresh everybody's memory. He's 6'10". And in transition, gets the ball out. That's why I say, if he gets out in transition, he's fun to watch. And you'll see this guy so agile, so nimble. Good play by Govins, getting it ahead. And in one full swoop, he doesn't even take a dribble, Tom, just reverses it around his back from the left hand to the right, which is a lot harder than the right hand to the left. Well, he's had himself a good career at St. Joseph's. His brother just starting his career, his younger brother just starting his career at Florida, where he is one of the leading scorers for the Gators as a freshman. And he also has another brother, a twin brother, John, who you know, grew up and played some ball with Pat throughout the years. Yeah, he had uh, basically a, a, a malformation in the brainstem and had to stop playing basketball. Well, now he goes to Rollins College. I'm very familiar with John Calathis because my nephew Nick plays in Rollins. He's a good player, but now he is an insurance agent. He runs an insurance company with his mom. Well, Pat 
wears the number 12 in honor of his brother John because that was John's number. Pat used to wear number 33, but Pat Carroll had that number when he arrived at St. Joseph. So he thought, you know what? How am I going to really encourage my brother and also honor him? I'll wear his number. And I don't know if there's any more shots left in Pat Carroll's jersey. <laughs> he, he was a That's scorer. That's an excellent boy. point. He was a scorer. You like to make sure you refresh those now and again. 43-37 the score and a blocking foul is called on Ahmad Divins. That's his fourth personal foul. And Tom, that's, a, that's about the third time we've seen that's supposed to be a hedge. You're supposed to get over there and deny the drive, but you got to sprint back over here. You don't need to get out too far. Hedge, wait for Govins to get over there. Now, Govins has got to make an effort to get over there. It's a good call. You know, the officials, as Nivens fell to the floor, he didn't like the call. But that's a good call. The officials are right on it. And, and that was a very good call. you got to make sure that you, you understand the defensive scheme. you got to help out. But you don't do it all yourself. It's called help defense. Nearly two minutes gone by here in the second half. C.J. Anderson called for the offensive foul as Calathis gets position. Big guy gets over there, and C.J. Anderson has been, you know, a little bit fuddled the first half. We had two points at the end of the first half. He scored, but you'll see here Calathis going over and moving laterally, and it was an elbow to the chin by C.J. Anderson. So now St. Joseph's down six can climb even closer with two minutes gone by here in the second half. Third personal foul for C.J. Anderson. D.J. Raymond and Josh Duncan are about to check back into the ball game for the first time in this half. They're at the scorer's table. Calathis with a spin move, caught on the elbow, and he gets it back out to Carr as the shot clock winds to 10 seconds and counting, and a foul away from the basket that will go against Drew Lavender. C.J. Anderson is doing a very good job defensively on Calathis, and then Xavier gives up the chippy foul at half court with only 10 seconds on the shot clock. Those are mental mistakes you can ill afford to make in a rivalry game like this. So C.J. Anderson checks out, so does Jason Love. Duncan is in for the first time, so is B.J. Raymond. Duncan just one point away from 1,000 for his career. And a fresh 35 for St. Joseph's. Calathis gives up his dribble at the free throw line. And he's fortunate that that ball wasn't stolen away as Govins tracked it down. Burrell is intense, and he is not letting Govins get the ball back. Once he gives it up, he's trying to deny Govins the basketball. Shot clock is at 10. Calathis for three, and it's off to the side. Govins with the offensive rebound. He may have got away with the travel, but he got it out to Carr. Calathis open again for three. This time it's good. It's only a matter of time before he lights up. You can never leave. Calathis, B.J. Raymond has, has to make sure he gets a hand out there. He cannot give too much help on the perimeter game. Timeout on the floor, 43-30. Xavier on top of St. Joseph's, but Pat Calathis has helped to bring the Hawks a little closer in the first part of the second half. Well, these are two of the better three-point shooting teams in the Atlantic 10. So, Steve, I guess we shouldn't be surprised that they both shot well in the first half. Well, St. Joe's shot a respectable 36%, but Xavier really did a little better than that, shooting 53%. And it's interesting to watch the St. Joe's team because they have 6'10", 6'8", guys shooting a jumper. And then Xavier, on the other hand, has a 6'9", guy in Duncan who was filling it up pretty good. See, Dante Jackson who can a three there. B.J. Raymond had eight points in the first First half on those two threes, two of four from outside the arc, and that was invigorating for the Musketeers. So now, Xavier with a three-point lead off the timeout. St. Joe's is playing very good defense. Xavier only had three turnovers in the first half. They have three turnovers here in the first three minutes of the second half. Loose ball picked up by Calathis. He's in transition. Three on two, leads it for Govins, who leaves it for Carr. That is a great extra pass. Govins saw the defender coming over ready to block it and made the extra pass, and St. Joe's is right back in it. St. Joseph's is on a 10-2 run to start the second half. Burrell covered by Gubbins up top. Finds Duncan, middle of the floor. St. Joseph's playing without a mod divot who has four personal fouls. Arvidas Ligius is in as the center. Ball is loose up top, picked up by Gubbins. To Tajit Carr, who goes up, and that should be an intentional foul it is. B.J. Raymond will be called for the intentional. And Xavier had a 16-point lead against St. Louis and pretty much did the same thing. Xavier has come out the second half. It's really the first five minutes you try to gauge the way Xavier's playing. Burrell making a poor decision. You never pick your dribble up. 
and jump at the same time. And then here right now, B.J. Raymond coming back, and you got to at least look like you're going after the ball. It's a good call by the officials. So now to Sheep Carr has a chance to tie the game. Doesn't do it there, but on the second chance to tie the game, and St. Joseph's will have the ball. And right now, St. Joseph, we talked in the early game about uh, how they have to get out of the gates and the keys to the game. Well, now they are getting out early in the second half, and they're getting after it. Second shot by Carr. It's good, and we're tied at 43. It's the first tie of the ball game. And St. Joseph's with the ball. Phil Martell in his 13th season on Hawk Hill. He was an assistant for 10 years as well. Inbounds goes to Ferguson. Aaron Govins covered by Burrell. Finds Ferguson inside. Now Kalik is outside for three. It's good. Splashes it home. When you get the ball to the middle, the defense collapses and everybody collapsed in. It was a nice pass by Ferguson out to Kalathis. And Kalathis, like we talked earlier, is, is getting on fire. He is a key element to St. Joe's recovery. Well, that's 12 points now for Kalathis to go along with seven rebounds. Lavender, a little jab step with his dribble. Love sets the screen that frees Lavender. Shot clock is at 10. Duncan tries to post up inside. Shot clock at five. Lavender launches, and it's good. It seems that every time Xavier needs a big basket, the little senior, Drew Lavender, comes through. He, he is really clutch. That is a big shot for Xavier. Well, Lavender with that three now is in double digits. So there you see our second tie of the ball game. We've had three lead changes as we hit the 15-minute mark here in the second half. Darren Govins to the basket. Nice move against Burrell. Used his body, good control, making a stronger basket. Right now, St. Joe's is getting movement to the basket. That's why it's opened up the outside. And Govins really taking it on the, and, on the drive. And Steve, they're doing all this without a mod Nivens. We've got a foul under the basket. It's going to go against Arvidas Ligius. Little bump of love. Well, St. Joseph's with a nice run to get back into this ball game to Sheet Carr. He's been involved, but so has Pat Calathis from outside. Well, it's been a 16-point swing for St. Joseph since there was two and a half minutes left to play in the first half. They lead it by two. Hey, it's time to take a look at our A-10 Conference Student Athlete Spotlight. And today we shine it on Andrea Florida from St. Joseph's University, part of the cross country and track and field team. She's from Reading, PA, a food marketing major and a great GPA of 3.86. So good for Andrea. Congratulations to her and all of the great student athletes. Boy, to be able to play sports and to have a GPA that high, it's an awful lot to be said for that. You know, they're gifted people. I'm oh, happy if I could do either one of them. <laughs> Out of the timeout, St. Joseph leads it by two. The Hawks' largest lead was four points. That was at the 10-15 mark in the first half. And the largest lead for Xavier was 14 points. Darren Govins called for the foul. That's his second personal foul. He was trying to match up with C.J. Anderson down low on the block. He got caught up in a, in a switch. Xavier's offense in the second half has not been running very fluid. The only person that looks like they're into the game has really been Drew Lavender. Good penetrating moves. Got to have some fluidity offensively. Good ball movement. Stanley Burrell picked up by Rob Ferguson. Into the paint. Nice help by St. Joseph's, but a nice find by Burrell. Missed shot by C.J. Anderson, who tracks down the loose ball and wants a timeout, but the official says he didn't get it to him in time. You can't do that anymore. You have to make sure you have possession and you're in bounds. C.J. Anderson was run out of bounds. What you like to do on that is try to throw it up as high as you can. I thought that's what he was going to do. And he stopped. He ain't really had a chance to do that, but you'll see right here. He's, he can't call timeout. You've got to be inbounds and have possession. So another turnover for the Musketeers here in the second half. Ferguson for three. It's good. Rob Ferguson with a three from the corner. It's a five-point lead for St. Joseph's. It's largest lead of the game. And it's so important that Pat Kalathis got in this game in the second half because now you have to really keep an eye on him. And that's leaving the other side open. Ferguson wide open for the three. And he's just as deadly as Kalathis out there. Absolutely. Rob Ferguson. 
shooting 41% for the season from outside the arc. Lavender with a nice crossover into the paint, bumps into Ligius. The shot by Brown off the side of the rim. The crowd wants a foul. The Hawks, though, take the ball. It's good penetration by Lavender. Brown just wasn't able to finish. That's two times in a row that the guards have made easy passes inside. One to Anderson, one to Brown. David just didn't finish. We zero under the 13-minute mark here in the second half. St. Joseph's with a five-point lead. And as the shot clock winds to 10, Tashid Carr puts up five fingers to run one offensive set. Shot clock is under five now. Govins into the paint. High banking shot, no good. Put back by Lidges as the shot clock hits zero. Xavier did not have any weak side help. Both defenders came over, and a long shot by Govins was tipped in by Lidges. And Tom, St. Joe's is doing this without Nevins. He's been sitting on the bench for the better part of five minutes. Another turnover to Sheet Carr in transition against Duncan. And the shot was way out of control. Now Xavier with the rebound. Stanley Burrell against the sheet car, finds Duncan, who puts it on the floor into the paint, leaves it for Anderson, and a touch off the glass. And that was a really nice move by Duncan. Duncan, an offensive weapon, so you have to respect that. Takes the ball into the paint, shovels it off to Anderson, and Anderson for this fourth point. Great pass by Josh Duncan, who's not a guy that can pass that well, but you'll see here, weak side coming over. Josh Duncan coming over and helping out, leaving Calathus alone. And at 6'10", he is deadly. And here's this great shovel pass by Josh Duncan to C.J. Anderson. Well, they had done that time and time again in the, the first part of the second half, but they weren't able to convert. They finally were able to convert there. Yeah, you got to look at Josh Duncan, the, the, the consummate team player, coming off the bench as a senior. Right there, he had a chance to get his 1,000 point. And he goes in and shovel passes for a layup, really doing everything he can for this team. Now, how long do you think Phil Martelli will ride Ahmad Nibbins on the bench? I guess it's going to be a, it's going to be a while. You know, I, I look at the way they're playing. This is not the way they played against Duquesne. No. I, I think they were really apologists against Duquesne, worrying about their buddy Ahmad. Now they're playing as a team and realizing they got to play without him. And I think they're doing a pretty good job of moving the ball around. Govins, I think, has come to play here in the second half with good dribble penetration. Well, he'll take a breather as Garrett Williamson is in the ball game. Last time Xavier lost here at the Cintas Center, February of 2006. Lavender on to Sheet Carr. Rob Ferguson against C.J. Anderson. Shot clock is at 10. Game clock under 12. Carr picked up nicely by Duncan. Lavender picks up the loose ball and a foul to Sheet Carr. You playing with the basketball on the perimeter, you gotta move it quicker. 11.52 left to play here in the second half. St. Joseph's on top by five, 53 to 48. One of the differences for St. Joseph's since the start of the year, the new year, has been really the play of Rob Ferguson and really how fluid he has become offensively. He can play inside, he can play outside. The other thing he's done well, Especially this evening, this afternoon, Tom, is that he has three assists, so he's accounted for over 21 points, you know, out of the 53 St. Joe's. So he is a guy they rely upon. And, you know, the guys look to him. They're looking for him as a scorer. Well, he's one of the captains for the St. Joseph's team, and Phil Martelli looks at Rob Ferguson like he looks at a lot of seniors. And all of a sudden, after the first of the year, they realize, wait a minute, my career's almost over. i got to step it up a notch. And he really has stepped it up a notch. He's averaging close to 13 points per game in his last seven games. Well, alongside Calathus, they play off each other so well. You know, you've got two big guys on the perimeter shooting the ball, but also they go inside. It really helps make a lot of pressure off. If one isn't shooting well, the other one is. Well, the steal by Duncan and Lavender gives Xavier the ball out of this timeout. 11-14 counting left to play here in the second half. Josh Duncan has a height advantage down low, and he was calling for that basketball. He got it. 1,000 points for Josh Duncan. In fact, he went right past 1,000 to 1,001. He really has picked the Musketeers up here in the second half. A nice pass to Anderson and then taking it strong down low. Ferguson answers with a three from the left side. He's got 18 points. It's a senior's game. When it comes time, the crunch time, Ferguson nailing a three. 
Well, Sean Miller was saying yesterday that the final month of the regular season and the final month of any season is about the seniors. It's the last time for all of them in so many ways. This is the last time they'll face St. Joseph's here at home. And he says that three seniors, including Josh Duncan, have been operating the same way as Justin Cage did last year, Justin Goldman, and Brandon Cole. And, and I think that throughout the years, that you had Sean Miller, you had Thad Mott and Skip Prosser. They've really relied on their seniors. As another senior just steps up and hits the three. Stanley Burrell with the three to make it a three-point game. Garrett Williamson slips going to the basket. The putback from Lidges no good. Williamson with the rebound, and he dribbles out. He's caught in a traffic jam. He finds Calathis outside, and Phil Martelli finds a timeout. He just thought, you know what, that was unraveling. Williamson lost his footing going to the basket. But then he went and got that, that rebound. But you'll see that the seniors always step to the forefront. Now, I really believe that Josh Duncan is just starting to hit his groove. He was calling for that basketball, Tom. They gave it to him, and then he got a nice pass from Raymond DeBarrell, who just raises up and drops the three ball. Yeah, for Josh Duncan, 1,001 points for Stanley Burrell with that three-pointer. Stanley Burrell now has 1,493 points, so he's a little ahead of the curve. And he was a scorer for his first two years, and you got to give this kid credit. He realized, let, after listening to Sean Miller preach, the same way he preached to Lionel Chalmers, you've got to play the full game. He's turned into a really good defender, and he also is a, a nice scorer, as you can tell there. How about this, though? Six 1,000-point scores in this game alone. And then you got a Bob Nivens who's only 10 points away from 1,000. Now, six grand sounds good, but seven grand, grand sounds even better. And I made a, a bet with the producer, David Ashbrock, that, you know, that uh, Duncan would get it before Nivens. There was a point where you weren't sure in the first half, right? You know. Calathis with the missed shot, Ferguson with the over the back. Well, Nevins had a great first half and only played a quarter of that half. Well, and fortunately for St. Joseph's, because they've had the lead for the last several minutes, because he has four personal fouls, he's on the bench, and they've been able to ride him on the bench. The only reason I would get him in a little bit earlier is to give him a little time to get that sweat working again, especially with that bad ankle sitting out, and it gets strained and gets a little tight. And checking foul up top on Garrett Williamson. There's a Bob Nivens, the junior from Jersey City, New Jersey, and famed St. Anthony's High School. Head coach Bob Hurley has turned that program into one of the best high school programs in the country. And now his son Danny is doing the same thing at St. Benedict's Prep in New Jersey. Great right over first. Right there, St. Joe's trapped in the corner. Xavier fell prey to throwing the ball in the corner. That's not where you get the ball on out of bounds. It's easy to trap there. Burrell on Calathis. There's a height mismatch there, but Burrell is so good defensively. John Miller says that what Burrell has done in this senior year is so contagious for so everybody else. As he has turned himself into an off from an offensive player into an outstanding defensive player as well. Lidge just slips underneath. And that's his second bucket of the game. He had played for Ahmad Nivens while Ahmad was out with the sprained ankle against Duquesne, and he had no points. And now he's able to pick up a couple of big baskets here. And you got to credit the kid. He's been here five years, only started one game, and that was the Duquesne game. But he just gives it his all. But it was a great feed from Ferguson to get him that wide open bucket. 58 53 the score. We head to the nine minute mark here in the second half. Morrell gave up his dribble. Finds Duncan in front of the Xavier bench. Duncan with a nice move against Ferguson. And up and under, he gets his own rebound. Ball is loose. Ferguson picks it up on the baseline. And they say it was out of bounds. Somebody else on Xavier's team's got to match that intensity of Josh Duncan. He is really going hard, but Xavier's got to make smart plays. And when you're taking the ball out of the basket, you'll see Calathis shielding so that Lavender can't get the ball. They throw the ball into the corner, and that's a natural trap because you have the sideline and you have the two defenders. And then on the opposite end, the slip by Lidges to give the bucket to St. Joseph's. So as the ball rolled out of bounds on the opposite end, Xavier and Stanley Burrell will inbound along the baseline. But there's only six seconds on the shot clock. Now that's a, a lifetime in the game of basketball. And Josh Duncan didn't hit, draw iron, so they, they didn't restart that shot clock. A steal by Cars. Burrell just threw it up for grabs. Three on one. Williams sits to the basket. Shot is good, and he's fouled by Jackson. That's not a play a senior should make. Stanley Burrell throwing the ball up for grabs. 
Xavier really struggling out of the out of bounds plays. You got to be able to get a, a better pass than that. I know Derek Brown can jump, but it was great defense by once again the man in the middle of it all to shoot guard is really doing a nice job defensively. Jackson and Duncan check out. So does Burrell into the game. Love and Lavender. And Garrett Williamson will go to the free throw line to try to finish off a, an important three-point play because it would give St. Joseph's an eight-point lead. Xavier, a really good offensive team, only has 12 points here in the second half. With only 8.50 remaining, somebody's got to get them going. Josh Duncan had done it a couple times, but you need more than one player. On the other end, everybody has been contributing for St. Joe's. Calathis, Ferguson, Lidges, and now Williamson. Williamson's three-point play, no good. Lidges nearly had the rebound, but he tips it to B.J. Raymond. So here we go, under nine minutes to play, a seven-point St. Joseph's lead. Musketeers with ten turnovers overall. Anderson explodes right past back to Galavis. Galavis is quick, but Anderson is speedy quick. Got the first step on Galavis, and he couldn't get back. Really nice drive for C.J. Anderson. Crowd starting to rise to their feet. Jam-packed Sintas center. St. Joseph's this year has won eight games on the road. Pat Calathis, a short three. And Love with the rebound. And he was wide open again. C.J. Anderson didn't close very well. You cannot leave that guy open. They're going to find him. And a bump on Arvidas Ligis again up top. I, I don't understand. It's a good move by Lavender getting around him. But that is basically a decoy. Make sure you contain penetration. And then you get back to your man. We've said it a number of times. But it's just a cheap foul, and now it puts one of the best free throw shooters in the conference on the free throw line in Drew Lavender. 85% yeah, for the free throw line. Stanley Burrell checks back into the ball game. B.J. Raymond checks out. And the front end of the one and one is good. For the final eight and a half, or eight minutes and four seconds, Xavier will be shooting with each foul. The Musketeers with five team fouls, St. Joseph's with seven. And you really wonder when Phil Martelli's going to put in Ahmad Nevins. It's still, he's been sitting there quite a while. And a lot of times you do that, the first thing that happens is they move defensively and get a foul call. Three-point lead for St. Joseph's. The length is covered by Anderson. And Anderson called for the hand-checking foul. So 7.53 left to play here in the second half. It's going to be a fresh 35 for St. Joseph's. Thanks to that foul on C.J. Anderson when we return. Talk ball. Back here at the Cintas Center, St. Joseph's leads it by three. Six different 1,000-point scores are involved in today's ballgame, Steve, and all are different in the way they do it. And they're, they're all playing well tonight. You got Calathis and Ferguson really knocking down the jump shot. And then on the other side of the court, you have C.J. Anderson, who does it more so inside at a lot of those points at Manhattan College. And Drew Lavender, who's done it both inside and outside. Stanley Burrell, the senior, and then also Josh Duncan. Duncan coming off the bench, and here's his thousandth point. A strong move in the paint. Some impressive numbers right there for all six of those guys. And then Ahmad Nivens only is only 10 points away from 1,000, but he's on the bench with four personal fouls and has been for quite a while. In this second half, St. Joe's has done a nice job of sharing the basketball. They only had six assists in the first half. So far, we're still less than eight minutes to go in the game. They have nine assists. It's a foul on Love up top, and that means that Tashit Carr is going to get a one-on-one -on -one opportunity. Well, we talked about the importance of this game, and there you see the standings of the Atlantic 10. It's such a crazy conference this year, particularly in the middle of the pack. But the top, you have Xavier at 7-1 and one, and St. Joseph's at 6-2. And, and Xavier still has to go to St. Joe's. They have to go to Charlotte, and so they also have to go to Dayton. And Dayton, by the time they get down, probably will have right and a little back. So this is an important game to hold court on your home court. Oh, it's a sheet car, misses the front end of the one and one, and Xavier gets the rebound. Lavender.
Carpenter from the elbow. Does he get the roll? Bucks Love gets the rebound. He's caught underneath, and he's going to go to the free throw line. The sheep car fouled him under the basket. And Jason Love continues to get better and better. And it really helps when he's in the game for the Xavier Musketeers because most of his rebounds are offensive. He'll have six, seven rebounds in a game, and they will be all offensive. And here you see five jerseys around him. He didn't really know what to do, so he's lucky to get that free throw. Smart, though. Just yeah. Pop it back up. And Love makes the first one, makes it a two-point game. Jason Love out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, at Abington Friends High School. That's his first point in the last two games. Got a lot of foul trouble in St. Louis. So now he's on the board. Wait, do we have a violation? Do we have a lane violation? I think it's, it's Duncan Lidges. We're going out under the basket on the free throw. Well, they're going to count the basket. I thought maybe Bob Donato was saying there was a lane violation, but they'll count the free throw. It's a one-point St. Joseph's lead, and that's all Bob Donato was trying to do, was trying to calm those two guys down. And I think that's smart. Both teams are being aggressive. There's no ill will. They're just going after it. A lot of times you get tangled up. You just get that forearm shiver like you do to your brother. <laughs> The 6 0 run for the Musketeers. Ferguson tried to slip free. Kalapha slips free along the perimeter, and he is fouled by Derek Brown. Let's take a look at what might have happened underneath between Duncan and Arvidas Lidges. Duncan tried to slip, and I think they tied up their, their arms. Now they're going strong at it. They're trying to box out. That's, you, that's what you teach in the third, fourth, and fifth grade. Box out. Lidges going after it. But uh, I think both the players knew that it was just. Good aggressive work, but I think uh, the referees wanted to make sure they knew they're calling it close. Kalafis' free throw is good. He'll get a second shot. Lead is back to two for St. Joseph's. Pat Kalafis with that free throw now has 13 points and seven rebounds. He also has five assists this afternoon. And you know, he's really struggled here when he's played in the past. Uh, Kalafis is averaging six points and about two rebounds, shooting 35% from the field against Xavier, so he's having a very good game compared to his, his statistics. Well, he has 14 points. Rob Ferguson has 18 on 7 of 8 shooting. A couple years back in 2004, Delonte West for St. Joseph's was perfect here at the Sintas Center in a victory by the Hawks over the Musketeers. And Rob Ferguson is near perfect at 7 for 8. Burrell. Along the baseline, tries to leave it for Love, who bobbles it, and then makes a good decision for Duncan for three. Xavier had three guys in the lane. Burrell made a nice penetrating move. Love really didn't have anything to do with it, so he just threw it back out. Duncan getting the three ball. That's our third tie. Rob Ferguson pulls out the defense, tries to answer with a jumper, tips it out to Carr. And it's a fresh 35. Carr kicks it to Kalathis for three. No good. And Ferguson bobbles the rebound. Here come the Musketeers. Lavender to Burrell for three. It's good. Talk about highly combustible, this offense for the Musketeers. When they get the crowd behind them, they get it going. Burrell not settling for the two ball. Xavier on a 12-2 run. You'll see Love has nothing to do but pass it out. Every defender for St. Joe's in the lane. And then Burrell in transition. Xavier on a 12-2 run. Boy, Stanley Burrell's got an awful lot of confidence. We've seen it over the years with the Xavier Musketeers. And we've also seen the confidence of the Xavier team climb over the, couple, the last couple of seasons. There you see their record last February, this February. They're trying to join Memphis and Davidson and Utah Valley State of all teams. With the perfect 10 0 marks with a victory here this afternoon. Rashad Miller and his coaching staff really try to coach, getting them ready for the A 10 tournament and then postseason play. And I think February, obviously, there's a lot of conference games, and it's very important to win that February. And that's what Xavier does. Right now, for, for St. Joe's, they got to get back to what got them in the, the lead. They got to have good ball movement, they got to knock down some shots. They're relying a lot on the three-point jump shot. They need some dribble penetration. Clock winds towards six minutes left to play here in the second half. It's a three-point Xavier lead. Kalathis in the paint, finds Ferguson. Tough catch. He was thinking about a three, but didn't get his feet set, so Kalathis takes it right to the basket. How about that shot? And the big guy can get in there. They have dribble penetration.
penetration. Their outside game's a lot better when they have, you know, that dribble, that balance. They've really gotten to shooting that three a little bit too much and forgot to get, get into the basket. 16 points now for Kalapis. Beautiful pass from Lavender to Duncan, and he tried to return the favor, but it's a turnover. Here's Carr. Bounce pass to Williamson. Left-handed layup, no good. Carr goes up, and he's fouled. Going up by Derek Brown. That was a good two-on-one look. Carr looking for Williamson. Williamson just doesn't get it over the front of the rim. But then again, getting out in transition. Well, that's the fourth foul on Derek Brown. I thought maybe they would give it on Duncan. You'll see right here, great hustle by Lavender. Getting out of bounds, and then you see Govins making the really nice fundamental pass to Williamson. Giving the ball up. Too many guys sit there and play around with the ball. That's a nice pass by Carr. Carr's first free throw is good. He ties the game at 65. That's our fourth tie of the ball game, and I'm sure it's not going to be our last. You've got to be happy if you're a St. Joe's fan. With Carr, he played actually for an old assistant coach of mine, Wayne Morgan at Iowa State. Transferred out of there when Wayne was released. He's got nine points and five assists, and has done a very good job running this team in hostile territory. So a one-point lead for St. Joseph's off the two main free throws by Tashif Carr. The Hawks a very good free throw shooting team, only at 67% for this ball game. Burrell thought about a long pass underneath to Lavender. Instead, he leaves it for Lavender outside. Burrell moving nicely without the ball, finds Anderson, who tries to find Duncan, who loses it out of bounds. They're going to say that SGU touched it last. 14 seconds on the shot clock, and right now, Ahmad Nivens getting up and coming in. Keep an eye on him to see how he's moving up and down that court with that bad ankle sitting out there for about 10, 11 minutes. Well, he's got four personal fouls. They go right at him. C.J. Anderson goes up. Shot blocked by Ferguson. Ahmad falls to the floor. Here's Carr in transition to Kalathis. Can't get the high backing shot, but the putback by Williamson is good. Great hustle transition. Williamson, Johnny on the spot. Kalathis went in, missed the layup. But Williamson getting a nice stick back. Very smart, though, for Xavier to go right after Ahmad Nivens, though, on that first possession. And who's the guy that picks it up? The senior. Duncan for three. It's short. Nivens with the rebound. Ferguson made a great play defensively. That's a big key in this game, the way they're playing half-court defense. Under four and a half minutes to play. St. Joseph's in the lead by three. Down by 14 at one point. They throw it into Ahmad Nivens and an offensive foul, and he's out. It happens so often when guys sit on the bench for a while, they want to get back in. You're sitting there, you want to do something to help your team, and that's all he was trying to do. Josh Duncan very smartly staying on him, knowing that Nivens is going to go to the basket. Stands his ground and takes a charge. But Nivens, a solid, solid player, but nice four under the chops. Duncan goes down. And Nivens doesn't even play a full minute minute after coming back in. Well, Arvinus Lidges, in his stead, performed well. I mean, he wasn't about Nivens. He had four points, and he's going to have to perform well again. And they, they were doing a nice job on both ends of the court this second half. You know, Kalathis had five points in the first half. He's got 11 so far here in the second half. They're going to have to rely on the other seniors to get him going. Well, before the foul on Ahmad Nivens, the previous possession by St. Joseph's worked out to be a great follow by Garrett Williamson. And he's one of these guys. He's consistent. You, you don't call his name a lot, but it's usually because he's playing very good defense or he's doing making the hustle plays. That's a big basket following the miss by Kalathis. Three-point lead for St. Joseph's. Xavier with the ball. D.J. Raymond in the game. And maybe, I think maybe I'm missing something because they do it all the time. I, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I think they're trying to do the hedge. It's called a hedge. Get over, stop the dribble penetration, and then recover back to the man. But Jason Love's done it. Nivens has done it. Well, is Xavier doing anything different to try to draw the contact instead of maybe going wide, staying inside a little bit? Well, they're going, I think you have the possession. When you have the possession of the ball, they have to have, you know, they have to be in front of you. So what they're doing is they're going straight to the basket. If you're going to take the charge, you better get way higher out. But then again, they'll cut, they'll slip the, uh, the pick and go to the basket. 
Terrell with 14 points. He makes one of two. 68-66. And now four minutes left to play in the second half. Again, Ahmad Nivens is out of the game. He's fouled out. Back to Lathis, trying to take over offensively, and he just took it to the baseline and fell off the baseline. Sean Miller switched up, put Burrell on the 6'10", Calathis. 3.49 left to play here in the second half. It's a two-point St. Joseph's lead. Well, in the second half of this ballgame, Rob Ferguson has 10 points for St. Joseph's, 18 overall. But Stevie also has been distributing the ball well also. He's, when, when you're that hot, you're 7 for 9, it's easy to get other guys open. You just see that nice Bob Pettit hook shot, but he's Mr. Inside, Mr. Outside, and he also has four assists to go along with it. He is a, he's a real key to why St. Joseph's has a lead here today. See the shooting, 7 of 9 overall, and 4 for 4 from outside the arc. He's not a guy that goes to the free throw line that often. That he's only been 27 times this year. A senior out of Mariner High School in Fort Myers, Florida. And while St. Joseph's was recruiting him, that's how they actually got in touch for the first time with Pat Calathis, you know, the whole Florida connection. And I'll tell you what, that's a great connection. They need to keep it. Mark Bass and the other assistant coaches have done a great job recruiting for this, this team. And, you know, not only the recruiting and the work they've done with trying to get guys here, but once the guys get here, those Mark Bass has worked with Calathis and really made him into a heck of a player. So the Hawks have changed up the look defensively. Derek Brown against Rob Ferguson can't get the slam to go, and Ferg is called for the foul. So Brown will get two free throws. Sean Miller does a nice job out of timeouts, really scripting plays, making sure he gets the guys the ball that he really wants to have. Like right there, getting Brown down low on Ferguson and trying to make a statement, getting the dunk out of the timeout. Brown, a left-handed shooter, makes the first one. And if he makes the second one, we'll have another tie. And we have our fifth tie of the afternoon, even at 68. Well, when you have five teams in the top 50 RPI like the A-10 does, these games are more routine than you would think. Night in and night out, good co college basketball games. Well, Phil Martelli said yesterday that, you know, St. Joseph's played a number of very good programs this year, Syracuse and Creighton and Gonzaga, but they have not played anyone of the class of Xavier. You know, this is, the, this is their big game. This is a, a game where they can kind of make a statement as a program. And they're holding up very well, despite having one of their stars out of the bench. Rob Nivens out with five personal fouls. Calathis with 15 on the shot clock. Can't get it to roll, but Lidges comes flying in for the putback. Lidges really is the MVP right now coming off the bench. Undersized inside, just playing all out. And that was a good defensive effort by Burrell on Calathis. So 70 to 68 the score. Burrell against the sheet car. Gives up his dribble. Finds Lavender though. And Lavender's so cool under pressure. Shot clock is at 10. So he's trying to get something to the Lavender going to the basket. Watch the step back jumper. Nice crossover. Awkward bounce pass. Ball loose. Williamson has it. Shot clock violation. Good defense by St. Joe's. They flattened out. The Lavender went to the basket. They made sure they helped out on it. But, you know, Tom, the guy that really has stepped up here for St. Joe's has been Lidges. He's doing it on both ends of the court. And you see right here where he just follows the shot and gets the stick back. From Montrose Christian. But also from Lithuania, I asked him, so what are you going to do after you're, you're done with your, your school this your schooling this year? He said, you know, part of me wants to go back to see some of my family in Chicago, but the other part of me wants to go back to Lithuania and see some family that he hasn't seen in quite some time. Well, the way he's playing right now, the Xavier fans would like to see him go back to Lithuania. <laughs> Garrett Williamson takes it right to the cylinder, and he gets the left-handed layup to go. Mr. Consistent, Williamson coming off the bench. Given St. Joseph a four-point lead with two minutes left. 72-68. We're about to hit the two-minute mark here in the second half. 
Xavier really standing around on offense, not getting much to the basket. And they trap Burrell in the corner, and he needs to call a timeout. It's one area of the court you do not want to pick your dribble up in. If you're going to go to that corner, you better have it in your mind that you're going to drive to the basket or have an open jump shot. But you'll see right here, Williamson just getting around C.J. Anderson and using the opposite hand. He missed one of those layups earlier. He wasn't going to miss this one. Well, sometimes you wonder when a guy makes a decision to go to the basket, a guy that doesn't score that often, if it's the right one, as he's starting to clear his path to the hoop. But Gary Williams has certainly made the right decision. And I think that the faith that Bill Markelly has shown in Williamson, calling him really his sixth starter, you know, really gives him the impetus to take that ball to the basket. Gary Williamson. As we mentioned from Lower Marion High School, has really done a nice job off the bench this year as the backup point guard. And there you see the standings. That's why this game is important. Now, these two teams will face each other again in Philadelphia in a couple of weeks. But a win today by St. Joseph's moves them into a dead heat with Xavier for the top spot in the 8-10 standings. And anytime you can grab a victory on the road, and Phil Martelli in his 13th year at St. Joseph's knows this better than anybody. Anytime you can grab a victory on the road in the 8-10, it's huge. And especially playing against the number one team in the conference, a team that's ranked 13th in the country and arguably one of the best teams that Xavier's had here in quite some time. you got to credit St. Joseph, but the game is not over yet. Shot clock is under 10. Burrell fades to the right, stops and takes a long-range three. No good. A long-range rebound by Raymond. Duncan calling for the ball down low. The senior wants it. He finds Burrell, who dribbles in a step. Now to dunk it inside, and he'll get a three-point play. Josh Duncan is having one of the best second halves that I've seen him play, and it's not because he's scoring, but because he's asking for the ball. He's demanding the ball, and his teammates are finding him. And you'll see Burrell getting the ball inside. He's calling for it, takes it in, he loses it, gets it back out. And then Burrell looking for his big man again, and Duncan taking it to the rack. He went in with his left hand, too, and he makes the, the free throw to finish off a three-point play. It's a one-point game with 126 to play. Well, this one has been as good as advertised. Garrett Williamson against B.J. Raymond brings the defense down. Right now, St. Joe's needs to get the ball into the hands of the senior, Calathis and Ferguson. Calathis from the elbow doesn't get the roll. Love with the rebound. And Drew Lavender, as he heads toward midcourt, sees that the clock is going to hit one minute and counting. So one point, St. Joseph's lead. Burrell against Williamson. Right to the basket, outside for Lavender. Extra pass to Raymond for three. Timeout with 40 seconds left to play. There's a difference of about nine seconds between the game clock and the shot clock. And it's far from over, but this is a great play by the senior Burrell. Drawing the defense, Lavender knowing that Raymond is open on the wing, and it's a great pass as you see that quick ball movement. Anytime you move the ball quick on the offensive set, you should get an open shot. Well, we said that B.J. Raymond was cool from outside the arc coming into this ball game. That was his first made three of the second half after making two in the first half. So it seems like he's got his confidence back. And, and you know what he else has done? He's, what else he's done this afternoon is he has four assists and four rebounds. And now that puts Xavier on a six to nothing run. Duncan's three-point play the old-fashioned way. And Raymond with a three ball behind the arc. Once again, St. Joe's had their shot. Galathus had that inside shot. Burrell is doing a very pesky job on defense, but Ferguson needs to get in the fray here. He's a senior. they got to look for him. St. Joseph's down by two. There you see the leading scores. Ferguson with 18, Galathus with 16. There's a difference of nine seconds between the shot clock and the game clock. Carr to the baseline. Caught in some traffic, he needs a timeout. You never pick your dribble up. We've talked about that, but Phil Martelli gets a timeout. Now, there's 11 seconds left. 
on the shot clock. A lot of time to get a good shot. Still think you got to get Ferguson the ball. No timeouts left now for St. Joseph. Xavier, meanwhile, has one timeout remaining. 20.9 to play, 11 on the shot clock. And again, St. Joseph just needs a basic field goal. And they, yeah, I like to see him have a little two-man game with Calathus. You got two of the big guys that can both go inside and outside. Now what Xavier's done, and you got to give Sean Miller a lot of credit. It's a big risk, but he put Stanley Burrell on Calathus in the latter part of the second half, and he has done a remarkable job shutting him down and denying him. And it's hard when you're a big guy, you have a little guy, and you're worried about losing that ball. Well, Stanley Burrell this entire year has done a fantastic job on the opposition. Some of the opposition position's best players, whether it be Eric Gordon, who is just 4 for 12 for Indiana, or even Darnell Harris from LaSalle. He may not be the scorer that Gordon is, but he is a scorer. Held him to four points. Ricky Harris from UMass, he held him to just seven points in the, the Musketeers' win up in Amherst. And then there was Brian Roberts here at the Sinta Center. He held him to just five points. He, he's done a remarkable job, and it's his last go-round, and he has brought a lot of energy. He's the guy that started that drive for the last bucket from B.J. Raymond, but right now, it's two possession, or one possession game. You gotta play defense and offense, you gotta execute. Carr inbounds to Rob Ferguson. He was able to hold his plant foot. Shot clock is at five. Govins loses it, picked up by Burrell, who kicks it across midcourt. They're gonna call a kickball, and I believe the possession is gonna go to Xavier. I think, did they call a foul? Oh, did they call a foul? They did. Pat Calathus has called for the foul. It was a good foul. If they called that, you'll see right here, Govins just loses a handle on it, and then Burrell. Boy, I thought the kick happened before the foul, though, Steve. Yeah, I did, too. I don't know what they called, but the senior going to the free throw line. Govins has lost the handle on it. John Miller looking for his 83rd career victory, but also the 20th win for Xavier would be their third straight 20-win season. Now, if he makes this, you wonder what Sean Miller's going to do. They have a foul to give. You know, do you give? Or they, they don't have a foul to give, but still, it's, it'd be a one and one They don't have a chance to shoot that three. And the way that St. Joe's shoots a three ball, you might want to look at foul if you're Xavier. Sean Miller burns his final timeout just to go over those same points to make sure that his team understands what they need to do in these final 13 seconds. The same with Phil Martelli, who's doing the same thing with his group on his side of the floor. Xavier end, has ended the game so far with an 8-0 run. And what they might look at doing, St. Joe's has to be ready for this. If Xavier puts that full court pressure on, St. Joe's does not have a timeout. They have to make sure they make crisp moves to the basket. You cannot hide from the ball when there's pressure defense. They got to get the ball into the full court and, and try to get a quick score. It doesn't matter if it's a two or a three, but they got to get a quick score. Well, we talked before that this has been a game in front of the sold out crowd that has been a game of runs. And right now, the Musketeers are on the last run over the last two minutes. Xavier has erased a four-point deficit and turned it into a four-point lead, so it's an 8-0 run for Xavier. We're in the throwback uniforms from 1958, honoring the NIT championship. Rob Ferguson will inbound. He'll run the baseline, finds the sheet car right at midcourt. Carr dribbles in, picked up on a double team. Finds Calathus, launches a three, no good. Rebound tipped. Anderson has it, it's loose. Darren Gubbins picks it up. Carr for three. Nowhere near the net, it goes out of bounds with less than a second left. And the Musketeers are going to survive and pick up their 20th victory of the season. It'll be the third consecutive 20 win season for the Musketeers. And Tom, on that possession, they didn't need a three ball. All they needed was a two. Dubbins could have taken it into the basket and went back and tried to get the three. 76 72, the final score. The Xavier Musketeers win their 20th game of the season, their eighth in the Atlantic 10. And they get their grip on the A-10 standings a little tighter. Four-point win for Xavier. We'll be back after these messages. 
that this game was about the seniors, and Steve, the seniors really stepped up. They really did, and, and it really said that anybody had to lose this game, but I thought Stanley Burrell's defense on Calathas in the second half was the key. Well, it was about runs, and the Xavier Musketeers put together a tremendous run to finish off this victory, and now they lead the Atlantic 10 by two games over St. Joseph's with an 8-1 record and another 20-win season. It's their third straight 20-win season. 76-72, the final score. Now, for Steve Wolf and our entire crew, I'm Tom McCarthy. For the latest Atlantic 10 scores, news, highlights, and analysis, log on to Atlantic10.org. This has been a presentation of CSTV, College Sports Television, the experts in college sports. So long, everyone, from the Cintas Center in Cincinnati. Have a great night, and thanks for watching.